Hello and welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you have been enjoying the stories told on this channel, feel free to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to help the channel grow. In today's episode, we will be shifting focus from individual criminals to deeper explore the widely recognized saying that, the boss is the boss. This common saying in organized crime has been around for ages, seen as a way to uphold the hierarchy within criminal enterprises. Developed to make new recruits see the boss as beyond reach. Surprisingly, though, this supposed rule hasn't held true throughout most of the Mafia's history. With the first two Mafia bosses ever, both being killed within a year of each other, the top position has had shaky security since its inception. To explore this notion further, we'll delve into some of the most famous hits and attempted hits in organized crime history, discussing the suspected motives, perpetrators, and the overall impact on the Mafia moving forward. Before we get into that, it is important to mention that many of these hits remain unsolved to this day, meaning some degree of speculation has been used to tell these stories. The beginning of the Mafia's history has long been debated, but many agree that the first official boss was Joe Masseria, known as Joe the Boss. Masseria came to the United States in 1902 and quickly got involved in criminal activities in New York. Masseria started out with the Morello gang, eventually taking over the gang after the murder of the boss, Salvatore d'Aquila. Under Masseria's leadership, the gang expanded its influence, bringing other Italian-American gangs under its control or collecting payments from them. Masseria's crew would include significant future Mafia heavyweights like Lucky Luciano and Vito Genovese. Despite his growing power, Masseria had rivals in the area. The most important of which was, Salvatore Maranzano. Tensions between the two would escalate into a full-scale war in 1931, resulting in extreme violence and casualties on both sides. With the war continuing on, Masseria fell victim to betrayal within his own ranks when Luciano struck a deal with Maranzano behind his back. The deal saw Luciano promising to set up up Masseria in return for an end to the war and control of Masseria's operation. On April 15, 1931, during a meeting at a restaurant in Coney Island, Masseria was shot dead by gunmen, allegedly including Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, Benjamin Siegel, and Ciro Terranova. With Masseria's death Luciano took control of his organization, while Maranzano became the boss. However the two had an uneasy relationship with each other, neither fully trusting the other. With the distrust growing, Luciano would develop yet another plot to get rid of the boss. This would come in the same year, when Luciano got word that Maranzano wanted to take him out. Hearing this Luciano decided to act first. Doing this on September 10, 1931, Luciano decided to skip out in a meeting with Maranzano, instead sending four men disguised as police officers to his office. The men would first search Maranzano for any weapons before stabbing and shooting the new boss. Being allegedly responsible for the murder of two bosses in the span of a few months Luciano seized control of the entire mafia. He would then use this power to establish the now infamous commission and organizing the five families in New York, shaping the future of the mafia. With the formation of the Mafia's commission and the new ideas put in place by Luciano, the landscape of organized crime in America was expected to become more stable. Having a structure in place and rules of operation, the now divided families would see relative stability over the coming years. However, despite this idealized structure being implemented, greed and ambition would once again plague the higher-ups in the Mafia. This would come to a head in the late 50s when once again two prominent Mafia bosses would be targeted in the same year. The first of these bosses would be Frank Costello. Costello would head the now-named Genovese family, taking control after former boss Vito Genovese went on the run to avoid prosecution. However, once Genovese came back and settled his legal issues, he would look to retake control of the family. Being well-connected to members of his family as well as others, Costello would not give up this position, relegating Genovese to a lower position in his former family. Genovese, always ambitious, would slowly plot to regain control. However, to do this he would have to deal with a powerful connection Costello had in the Mafia, Albert Anastasia. Anastasia would be the head of the now Gambino family and to this day is viewed as one of the most violent mobsters of all time. Leading the infamous Murder Incorporated crew, the fear of making Anastasia an enemy would be in the forefront of Genovese's mind. However, fortunately for Genovese, he would run into another ambitious mobster, Carlo Gambino. Gambino, fast rising in the family, would allegedly, like Genovese, want to take power in the family and was willing to do so at any cost. 
This would result in the two planning to take out both Costello and Anastasia that year. The first move in this plan came on May 2nd of 1957, and saw Frank Costello being shot in the head in front of his apartment building. Alleged to be carried out by the future boss of the family Vincent Giganti, this shooting would not have the intended effects as Costello would survive. Despite living through this attempted assassination, Costello would choose to leave the Mafia instead of going to war. He would promise to leave the life behind in return for no future violence taken up against him. Getting what he wanted, power, Genovese was said to agree with this, leaving Costello alone. However, relinquishing this power wouldn't stop the violence set in motion against Anastasia. The second attack on a boss this year would be way more infamous and has been shown in movies and TV shows for years. This hit would take place on October 25, 1957, when Albert Anastasia went to his barber shop at the Park Sheridan Hotel. Said to be relaxing in the barber's chair, Anastasia would be quickly ambushed by a group of men wearing scarves around their faces, who opened fire immediately. Being hit with multiple shots, it was reported that Anastasia attempted to lunge at the shooters, but in the confusion would lunge at their reflection in the mirror instead. Being hit with more bullets, Anastasia would be fatally wounded, dying on the barbershop floor. The claims on who exactly carried out this hit have been disputed for years, with some claiming the notorious mobster Joe Gallo was responsible, with others pointing to members of the Profaci family. However, the common notion is that the killing was orchestrated by Carlo Gambino, as he would quickly take power after this murder. Following these attacks, Genovese and Gambino would take power, to a varying degree of success. Gambino, being the more successful of the two, would look to push the Mafia forward into the next generation. Going into the 70s, the landscape of the Mafia would be drastically different, with the five families seeing changes in leadership due to increased pressure from law enforcement, alongside failed power plays. One family that would be somewhat stable going into the 70s was the Colombo family. The family would be headed by the now namesake of the family, Joe Colombo. He would take over the family after his predecessor was forced to leave the Mafia by the commission, after it was discovered that he, alongside Bonanno family boss Joe Bonanno, were planning to kill multiple bosses to take complete control of the family. Colombo has been alleged to be the one who blew up this plan, going to the commission and telling them about the plot. For his loyalty to the commission, he would be given the position of boss and would hold power for the following years. At first, he would be seen as a relatively low-key and powerful boss, adding needed stability to the family. However, as the 60s ended, he would begin to become the first major mafia boss to become a public figure. He would create the Italian-American Civil Rights League, where he would be seen giving speeches, attending protests, and organizing rallies to promote rights for Italian-Americans. This league would grow rapidly in membership and publicity in the early 70s, with the notion of a mafia boss being a civil rights activist catching media attention. The growing publicity was said to anger other bosses in the Mafia, with them allegedly telling Colombo to stop. Refusing this, Colombo would continue to grow the league. However, this would not be the only problem that Colombo would have from powerful members of the Mafia, as in 1971, Joe, Crazy Joe Gallo would come out of prison. Gallo would be imprisoned while he was at war with the former leadership of the Colombo family. Coming out of prison, Colombo would meet with Gallo to ensure no more violence between Gallo and the family. However, this meeting would not go as attended as Gallo was said to leave infuriated after Colombo offered him only $1,000 for his time in jail and to continue peace. Following this conversation, Colombo would continue with operations and would attend his Italian Unity Day rally. At this rally, Colombo was shot three times on his way to give a speech. He was shot by a man named Jerome Johnson, who was immediately killed by Colombo's bodyguards after the shooting. After being shot, Colombo would be paralyzed and would be hospitalized for the rest of his life until 1978, when he died of cardiac arrest. Despite the police concluding that this murder was carried out by a lone gunman, many would believe that it was planned by Joe Gallo. Unlike the previous murders in this video, this one would have immediate repercussions with Gallo being shot and killed in 1972 while out for dinner at Umberto's Clam House. These back-to-back -back killings would bring a lot of attention to the Mafia, but would pale in comparison to the publicity of the hit that followed. Continuing into the proclaimed golden age of the Mafia, a hit would take place in the 1980s that would draw global media attention and still has a resounding impact on the Mafia to this day. This, of course, is the infamous Paul Castellano hit. 
A public hit that has been extensively covered in many different forms of media is important to include, as it, to this day, is still one of the most impactful mafia murders of all time. With the names involved in this hit becoming household names, this moment is what most point to as the start of the decline of the mafia. The tension that led to this hit began in 1976 when Paul Castellano was given the boss position following the death of longtime boss Carlo Gambino. Upon his ascension to the top, a divide in the family would already start to be seen. This came as many believed that longtime underboss and Cosa Nostra loyalist, Neil Delacroix should have been given the position. Despite being looked over, Delacroix would accept that Castellano was in charge, being caught on wiretap infamously saying, the boss is the boss. Even with Delacroix's acceptance, many in the family would still harbor resentment over this decision. However, with Delacroix's support, the family would be able to stay intact under the leadership of Castellano. Running the family over the next few years, Castellano was said to further the divide in the family, as many believed he was too business-oriented and tried to separate himself from the street. Buying a massive house in the Staten Island, Castellano would make associates drive out of the city to meet with him. This would upset many, but most importantly would upset street-tough gangster John Gotti. Gotti and his crew, known for speaking their minds, would be vocal of their discontent. Delacroix would act as a sort of mentor for Gotti and would attempt to silence the discontent, attempting to get Gotti to accept Castellano as boss. However, a breaking point would come when members of John Gotti's crew were caught on wiretap talking badly about the boss and about a heroin trafficking operation. Castellano, said to be against drug trafficking, would ask for the tapes to decide a punishment for the crew. The crew would refuse this claim, causing tension on the boss's side towards them. Now with anger on both sides, the only person keeping the family together was Delacroix. However, he would soon pass away, leading to Gotti making a massive power play. Following the passing of his mentor, Gotti would allegedly turn to Frankie DeChico and Sammy Gravano to develop a plan to take out the boss. With the support of major players within the family, a plan would be devised to take out the boss in December of 1985. On December 16th of this year, the plan would take place. According to testimony from Sammy Gravano, men in the hit squad would wait outside the entrance of Castellano's favorite restaurant Spark Steakhouse. Coming here for a meeting, Castellano would pull up outside the restaurant alongside his driver and bodyguard Tommy Bellotti. Gotti and Gravano were said to be watching from a parked car for Castellano's arrival, with Gotti said to give the go-ahead on the hit from a walkie-talkie. Upon getting the go-ahead, the hit squad would open fire on Castellano and Bellotti as they stepped outside of the car. Castellano would be hit with six shots, dying instantly. The team responsible for the shooting has been alleged to be Salvatore Scala, Edward Lynn, and John Carnelia, with Carnelia being the one alleged to have fatally shot Castellano. Following this hit, the Mafia would become massively publicized throughout America, with coverage of this killing being on TV and newspapers throughout the country. Following his plan, Gotti would come into power after the killing, resulting in the infamous Gotti era of the Mafia. Following this publicized killing, the Mafia in New York had years of fallout and violence before settling to where they are today. Despite this relatively lower profile, major murders and organized crime still are prevalent to this day. These crimes illustrate that despite what rules may be set out when it comes to the criminal underworld, they will only ever be selectively enforced and followed or broken to benefit those vying for power. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on the channel, feel free to hit the like and subscribe button to help the channel grow. If there are any topics you would like to see covered in future videos, feel free to leave a comment down below, if not, I will see you next time with another story from the underworld.